Let me ask a question real quick. How many of you guys are afraid of heights? Who's afraid of heights in the room? You can put your hand up. That's not, it shouldn't scare you to put your hand up. But, all right. All right. Um, I'm afraid of heights. You know, you might've heard me talk about it. What's weird though is that I'm not afraid of all heights. It's only some things. I don't know if anybody else is like that, but certain things like, man, they'll freeze me in the moment, but other things don't bother me at all. For example, um, I can fly on a plane just fine. I feel perfectly comfortable on a plane. As a matter of fact, I'm comfortable on big planes and I've learned that I'm actually comfortable in small planes. Uh, I have an uncle named Tony. He's a pilot. And um, I don't know if you know any pilots, but when you become a pilot, you don't just get your license and they're like, here you go, fly any plane you want. Um, you actually have to like slowly work your way, bigger, bigger, bigger planes. And all I knew when I was younger was my uncle was a pilot. And um, so he asked me one day, hey man, you want to go up? Uh, he lives in Miami and he was like, you want to go up on the plane? Man? You want to go fly with me? I was like, dude, I am in. And um, I realized quickly um, that it wasn't what I thought it was going to be when we showed up at this hangar and uh, we pull into the airport and now we're behind the fence, you know, we're usually, you know, in, I don't know, if, I don't normally get behind the fence. So I felt like, man, we are important. We're like out here on the runway somewhere. And um, he's like, we pull up to this hangar and he opens the door and I'm still in the car. And he's like, hey man, I need your help. Come out here. And I come out of the car and, and he has hooked up this wheel and this metal hitch to the plane. And he's like, here, help me pull it out. Now, I'm a big, strong guy, but I'm not planning on pulling a plane. And it's just me and my uncle pulling this plane out. And it turns out to be this little two-seater plane. And uh, we go up on this plane, and, and, and he even opens up the hatch at one point while we're flying. And I got to be honest, I, I, I was nervous because he's my uncle that's flying it, but I wasn't scared of heights on the plane. But can I tell you this? You couldn't pay me enough money to jump out of that plane. Like, like my wife over there, she's dying to go skydiving. Yeah. Don't clap for that. Nope. Yeah. Don't encourage that. Listen, she's dying to go skydiving. I am confident that we will die if we go skydiving. <laughs> it's the same words, just a little bit different. All right. Um, I can say this. I, I'm not afraid of roller coasters. I actually like roller coasters. Another thing where some people heights have a problem. Um, who here loves roller coasters? Who here would rather not? Uh, who here grabs, holds the bags, right? Like, you, like listen, we, we're on to you. We know it's that you're scared. You're like, I'm just going to serve everybody and hold the bags. No, you're just scared. It's okay. Like, it's okay. You don't have to say that, you know? But um, I, I love, um, there's a couple of roller coasters I love. I love the Kraken over at SeaWorld uh, because it's so long and smooth, steel coaster. I really like that one. Um, I love the Hulk at the Universal Studios because it, um, you're just sitting there and then you get just launched. You're like, whoo, you just shoot up into the sky. And I, I love that. Um, uh, I know there's a roller coaster that I'll never ride again. There's one called the Kraken at SeaWorld. I'll never ride that thing again. Okay, I think the devil made that ride. And uh, like, I, I can get on a roller coaster and you know, you, you get hooked up, you know, and tick, 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 tick. As long as that little tick, 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 that's the point where the, the person with heights has a problem. But as long as I'm looking up at the sky, and talking to Jesus usually. <laughs> like, I'm good, right? I'm good. I know once that free fall goes, you know, we're good to go. The Kraken, though, you get in your seat and they, you know, they hook you up and then your, your feet go over this little bar and then the seat does this. And now you're facing downwards, which like if you're going through the roller coaster, it's not a big deal. But that little like tick, 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 tick part, you're now facing the earth as it's slowly going away from you hundreds of feet in the air and all my weight is on this thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm a big boy. This thing, I'm waiting for that moment when you hear the release, the shh, like, yeah, you know, so roller coasters. Here's the deal. It doesn't matter what kind of roller, there's all kinds of roller coasters out there, right? There's wooden roller coasters, steel coasters, right? There's um, a tall ones and shorter ones and uh, they're, they're big and small. They, they all look different, but there's one thing about all of them that they all have in common. They're going to throw you around, right? They're going to throw you up. Gonna, you're going to go up. You're going to go down. You're going to go up. You're going to go down, sideways, upside down, some twists and turns. But they're going to go up and down. And, and here's the thing is, as much as I like roller coasters, I'm confident of this. I don't want my life or my walk with Jesus as a disciple to be like riding a roller coaster, let me explain. It's too often that our walk as disciples of Jesus looks like a roller coaster ride. 
We're up, we're down. We're up, we're upside down. We're up, we're getting thrown around, we're all over the place. I mean, one minute, we're growing and we're walking with Jesus, we're connected, and we feel like, man, we're in the middle of his plan. And then the next minute, we're we're upside down, right? We're fumbling, we feel alone and lost, and we're like, what is happening right now? For some of us, our relationship with Jesus resembles the Hulk, the roller coaster of the Hulk, right? We find Jesus or we found Jesus and we just launched into his purpose, right? We launched into his presence and and we started praying and we're going up, right? We we started started seeking his face and we started reading the Bible and we we joined a a life group. Man, now we're cruising. We feel like things are good. Sky's ahead of us, you know? And then all of a sudden some time goes by and we stop reading the word. And it's like we hit that hump and we start going down. We were praying and we were telling people about Jesus, but now we're not praying so often and we're telling nobody and we find ourselves going down. We we no longer are a part of community. We're no longer a part of a life group. We're no longer really connected and now we're in a free fall. You know what, I'm gonna tell you what I call that life. I call that the Christian coaster. Can I tell you that you were never meant to ride that ride? Can I tell you that... um, that, that today what I want to do is I want to help you get off of it because you were made for more. Jesus died for you to have more than some wild, crazy, up and down experience with him. He, he died for you to have a stable, consistent walk with the God that doesn't change. The God that has a plan and a purpose for your life. A real relationship that's consistent. See, I believe that our, our lives should be less like roller coasters and more like, um, like a rocket in space. Here's what I mean by that. Let me give you a little uh, science here, a little, little rocket science here, because I'm brilliant. Sure, you're right. You know, There's this thing called, um, uh, it's called the uh, inertia factor, okay? And this is what the inertia factor says. The inertia factor says that you need propulsion, something to push you in a certain direction as long as you're in our atmosphere. But once you leave our atmosphere... Right? This inertia factor says that you will go in the same direction at the same speed until something moves you or changes you. In other words, there's this consistent going in the right direction or in whatever direction you're going at the same speed consistently. I think that's what our walk with Jesus should look like. It's a consistent walk into his plan, into his purpose. Right? Where he's the only one that shifts us. It's not something else. It's not our situation. It's not ourselves that all of a sudden try to shift us and move us. But instead, this life doesn't shift us. Jesus is what moves us and shifts us. I think our lives are supposed to be stable and consistent. So today I'm going to give you four simple principles that I believe will help us do two things. One is it'll help you get off the Christian coaster. And then two is, it'll stabilize your relationship with Jesus. Okay, you guys ready? Let's pray real quick. Jesus, we want to hear from you. We want your word to come alive. We want it to be applicable. We want to be able to leave this place and say, man, I I heard you, Jesus, speak to me. Sure, Lord, I hope you speak to the person upstairs and the person on the left side of the room and the person on the right. But more than that, Lord, I want you to speak to me. Hush everything else that's trying to get my attention, Lord, and let me focus on you, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. All right, so four principles that help us bring consistency and and stability into our walk with the Lord, right? Here's the first one. We have to live in his presence. We have to live in his presence. Choose to live in his presence. In his presence, okay? One of the greatest fuels for sin in our life is secretiveness. Everybody say, I got a secret. Okay? Secretiveness, hiding, lying, sneaking, uh, you know, however you want to put it, like all that goes hand in hand with sin. And, And that's been the case since the beginning of time. Let me prove it to you. Adam and Eve, right? You guys remember Adam and Eve? God made Adam and Eve, and and they're in a garden, right? And and everything is good with Adam and Eve and God. They're so connected that they actually walk hand in hand. They are talking face to face with God, and they're living at a place that is perfect. Perfect. The Garden of Eden. But then, 
What does the enemy do? The enemy shows up and the first thing he does is he lies. He lies to them. He lies to them about the tree of life. And he, and he tells them, like, listen, God is trying to hold you back. God doesn't want you to know what he knows. God doesn't want you to be as strong as he is. And, and he lies to Adam and Eve. And they fall for his lies. And once they do, they sin. And as soon as sin shows up, what's the, what's the next thing those two do when God shows up? They hide. They hide and they cower and they, they cover themselves with leaves and, and they, they actually, they're like, where are, he's like, where are you? Where are you? He, God has to look for them and they're right there hiding from him. Why? Because sneaking and hiding and covering and lying go hand in hand with sin. It's been happening since the beginning of time and you know what's crazy? It's the same thing that Satan has us doing today. He's still doing the same things to us, Right? We, 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 we try to hide the things that we do that we shouldn't have done. Not only from each other, we try to hide those things from God. And some of us have become so good at this hiding and pretending like we're so great that we've actually become professionals at it. We've actually lost some of ourselves. Sometimes we say things like, man, you don't know the real me. And then you ask somebody and they're like, I don't know the real me. I've been lying so much. Listen to me, you, you may have fooled others. You may have even fooled the people closest to you. But let me, in, let me let you in on a little secret, right? There's one person that you've never fooled. And that's the one that made you, that knows you. His name's Jesus, right? Listen to what David says about God's insight into our lives. This is David talking. He says, where can I go from your spirit? This is Psalms 139, verses 7 through 12. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depth, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day for darkness is as light to you. Verse seven says it all. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? You wanna know where the, I'm gonna give you the answer to that. It's in Hebrews 4.13. Here's what he says. It says, nothing in all creation. Everybody say Nothing. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. There's nothing that God doesn't see you do. Look at your neighbor and say, you might want to put on your seatbelt if you didn't do it when Clint told you. Let me say that one more time. There is nothing that God doesn't see you do. You know what, I wrote a little poem. I'm gonna I'm I'm say a little poem to y'all. Check this out, you ready? Roses are, listen, this is deep. All right, roses are red, violets are blue. Remember that thing you did that you thought nobody saw? God says, I do. That's one of them ones that makes you go, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> right? Now, here's the deal. The thought that Jesus sees everything can actually make your heart kind of, uh-oh, glitch for a second, don't it? I mean, for a moment there, some of us in the room had that, you know, the pit in your stomach when it drops. You're like, oh, God sees everything. Yeah, yeah. oh, oh, right? Like there's a moment there where that can happen. Can I tell you that that's exactly what Satan wants to happen? Yeah. That feeling, yeah. the idea that God sees everything, for it to be a negative thing, that's all from Satan. Yeah. That's not the God we serve, yeah. right? He wants you acting like Adam and Eve. He wants you thinking that you have to hide and cover yourself from a God that already knows everything. See, the enemy of your soul wants you to think of God as if he's some kind of mad parent that knows you've done something wrong, right? You, you remember that parent, right? You, you tried to avoid them. If you're for anything like me, some of y'all look at me like you've never gotten in trouble. You're lying right now. In church. 
You remember that, right? You got in trouble with your mom or your dad, or you just got in trouble, or you knew they knew, but you haven't talked about it yet. They walk into the room, and you're like, whoop. You just avoid eye contact at all, you know? Hey, you want some orange juice, son? Nope. <laughs> right? That's what, that's what the enemy wants us to do with the Lord. He wants us to think like he's some sort of mad, angry parent that we're trying to avoid, right? Hey, we're, we're, we, oh, we can't look at Jesus in the eye. He doesn't want to see from me. He, I'm messed up. I'm broken. Does he even know if he really knew who I was, he wouldn't even want me? But that's not true. Why? Because we know he's a God that's seen you at your worst and still chooses you. He's seen you at your worst moment, not your best moment, but your worst moment and says, I choose you. I choose to die for you. I love you. Let me ask you this question. What would you do to be accepted? I'm talking about fully, really accepted, flaws and all. Because that's the kind of acceptance that God has for you. A God that knows every negative thought you've ever had, yet looks at you and says, you are precious to me. What kind of God does that? What kind of God says, I will completely forgive you, and then from that moment forward, I still don't expect you to be perfect. That's how much I love you. See, the truth is we have a choice. We have a choice on how we see God's presence in our life. We have a choice in choosing to either live in his presence or choosing to live like the enemy wants to, avoiding him and only letting him into parts of our lives. See, we can listen to the enemy of our soul and be intimidated by God, or we can know that he is for us, that he is with us, right? Can I tell you that there was a point in my life when I used to be nervous about God and thinking the more I found out about him, the more I realized the sin in me, the more I realized the sin in me, the less I thought he would want me. But then I realized, no, 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 he knew all that, knows all that, and still chooses me. So all of a sudden it changes everything because now instead of thinking like, oh my gosh, God sees everything. Instead, I think, you know what? God's always with me. You know what happens when you recognize that God's always with you and he's for you? You walk different. You talk different. You respond to life differently. All of a sudden, I, I, like, I love that God's with me all the time. Why? Because I know I'm weak. And when I'm weak, guess what? He's strong. He's strong. I've made it through times in my life when I've been weak, not because somehow I found it in me. Like I, the, I, the tiger didn't start playing and I'm like, okay, I'm going to make it. No, Jesus showed up in my life and said, son, I'm going to help you up. Son, we're going to take this next step together. Next thing you know, I'm on the next day, the next week, the next month. Now I'm in the next season looking back going, man, my God is faithful. And when I was weak, he is strong, right? When I am sick, he's my healer. When, when, when I am lost, when I am broken, when I don't see the other side, he all of a sudden shows up with joy in the morning. And he says, no, no, I'm your hope. And I got a plan and a purpose. There's a difference in the perspective that I have when I recognize that God's with me. I'm not scared and trying to hide from him. I'm recognizing that he sees me and that he still chooses me. Listen to Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. It says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said this, never will I leave you. Never will I choose to leave you. Never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my what? He's my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? See, that first step in getting off that Christian coaster is choosing to live in his presence. God, I live for you. I live with you. Here's the second one. We follow his plan. Follow his plan. Now, there, there once was a man named John, right? And, and John and his wife were going somewhere they had never been. And John goes out and he jumps in the driver's seat of his car. His wife gets in the passenger seat and she pulls up the address on her GPS and starts telling John where to go. And somewhere along the drive, John's like, I know where I'm going. Stop telling me where to go. As a matter of fact, I know a shortcut. At least he thinks he does, Right? 
How many of y'all know what happens next? Next thing you know, they find themselves some, some dead end street lost. That's when I look at my, I mean, that's when John looks <laughs> at his wife, right? And he says, he says, I, aren't you, ha- are you happy now? As if she did something to get them lost. How many of y'all know she didn't do anything to get them lost? <laughs> the truth is she was giving him directions, right? He's the one that chose not to follow the directions, not to follow the plan. I mean, you've heard me say it a hundred times already if you come to this church a while, what? God has a plan and a purpose for your life. Here's the other side to that. It's up to you and me to follow the plan. Like we choose, we have to choose that every day. I keep finding and running into disciples um, who look at God and they, they act like it's his fault that they're not living out the plan and purposes of, his, of their life. As if he's not giving instructions, like if he's the one choosing for them. I wish he would choose for us. But trust me, there are times where I'm like, God, I give you my heart, I give you my life. Could you send down some rope? I'll just tie it to myself and you can just pull me and drag me wherever you want. Like that'd be so much easier than having to choose every day to die to myself and saying, God, what would you have for me? Let's, let, let me give you another example here. Um, let's, say, um, let's say I call you up one day and I'm like, listen, I was praying and I felt like the Lord told me I'm supposed to give you $100. And you would say? Yeah. Right, exactly. And I say, listen, I, I need you to come to my house to get the $100. Right now, most some, some of you guys know where I live, and you shouldn't, but you know where I live. <laughs> now, but but most of you guys don't, and I would say, listen, here I'm gonna give you directions to my house, all right? Because I got this hundred dollars that God has for you. Here are the directions. I, you need to go down this street, and you need to find go to the Dollar General, turn right, go here, turn left, go, and I give you all the directions. You know, what if you just decide, you know what? I know, I'll get there. You live in Crestview, and you just start driving around, screaming out, Pastor Mike, out the window, <laughs> right? Well, let's just say you don't find me, right? Well, let's just say you see somebody. You're like, oh, you know what? Uh, th- there's, there's John. John knows where Mike lives. He, know, he, knows, he knows Pastor Mike. You go over to John. You're like, John, do you know where Pastor Mike lives? And John's like, I, I, I think I heard once that he lives over in this neighborhood. And you're like, perfect. So then you drive over to that neighborhood and start driving around. Pastor Mike. You just, and you, you never get to me. Whose fault is it that you did not receive the blessing that God has for you? Some of y'all would say, well, like, well, I mean, I didn't know how to get there. No, no, I gave you directions. You chose not to follow them. Some of y'all will even point at John and be like, well, John sent me the wrong way. Who told you to ask John or listen to John? Come on, John. If you choose not to follow, right, God's plan, it's fine. You just can't get mad when you're not receiving the things that he promised you. You just can't get mad when things aren't working out the way you want them to. Well, I heard once, you know, I'm going to, Lord, shut the doors that you don't want me to walk through and open the doors that you want me to. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard somebody pray. I love you, but God, good Lord, come on. God can bust any door he wants to open, first of all. And the enemy does nothing but walking around shutting doors that God can bust through. And just because an opportunity shows up doesn't mean that's the door you're supposed to walk through. I'm not looking for good opportunities. I'm looking for God's opportunities. God, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do with the resources, with my time, with my life? What do you have for me? Everything good isn't God. And every advice from a godly person isn't God either. That's why you're supposed to open up the word and spend time with him every day. Well, you must not be talking about pastors. No, no, pastors included. My job is to push you towards Jesus so that he can speak to you. He will not speak to me about your life before he speaks to you about your life. Now, he might tell me to tell you, hey, you ain't listening. But God has something to tell you. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on whose understanding? On your own understanding, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And who will make your path straight? He will make your path straight. Because the truth is, is there are going to be times when you don't understand the why. 
Why, God, why are, you, why are you leading me in this direction? Why are you telling me to do this? Why am I supposed to save when I have enough money to buy this thing and I've been saving forever, but now that I have it, I still don't feel released to go do it? Don't worry about the why, just worry about the he. He, wait for he, him to tell you what to do with what you have and who you are and where you're supposed to go. Man, I hate my job. Okay, who provided that job for you? God, has he told you to leave that job yet? If he has, you leave it and he'll take care of you on the next step. But if he has, and guess what? Don't. Because God is the one that leads you. How many of y'all got a puzzle piece as you walked in? Pull it out. Pull it out real quick. Pull it out. I want you to examine it. Look at it real close. All right? Look at it real close. Once you feel like you're confident of what your puzzle piece, you know, you see with the markings and whatnot, just, just hold it up. Just hold it up. I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but I will. I'm going to ask some questions. All right, cool. I'm going to just ask you right here. So, so what's the, the whole puzzle of? The whole picture? Mountains and sea. Mountains and sea. Okay. Interesting. Anybody over here? I mean, do you, uh, do you know what it is? The picture? What's the whole picture? The whole puzzle? You're like, what in the world? Why'd you call on me, right? <laughs> I know. Anybody upstairs? All right. Like, we can guess, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that's a bad guess. Maybe. I don't even know what colors yours is. Mine's blue. Right? We don't know. But listen, here's the deal. What if God gives us little pieces of the plan, and that's all we can see, and we do what, what she did, which is we're like, well, I'm just going to take a guess. And let's say this is the direction we're supposed to go, right? What, we, what would we do? I'll tell you what she would do. She just might get in her car and start driving towards mountains. Right? Like, you, you just don't, if, you, if we guess, right, if we're not sure, like, that, sometimes God doesn't give us the whole piece of the puzzle, but we can't see the whole piece of the puzzle. Can I tell you what his perspective is? This is what he sees. You can show the picture up there. That's the whole puzzle. So he sees the whole piece while we see a tiny little piece, Right? Here's the difference. Like, there's too many of us looking at this piece or the few pieces God gives us, and we're like, God, let me help you get to where we're going. I know where we're going because we think we're smart enough or we think we're strong enough. Can I tell you that we're not? His perspective is different than our perspective. Well, I'm going to tell you what the real question is Do you trust the Lord? Do, do we really trust the Lord? Do we really trust that He's with us? Do we really trust that he's for us, that he's walking with us, that he's leading us? Because if he is, then we can put our trust in him and stop worrying about the whys and just worry about spending time with him. Just start worrying about just recognizing his voice. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but what? But in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. If you want to get off that Christian coaster, you need to live in his presence, but you also need to follow his plan. You need to live in his presence. You need to follow his plan. Here's the third one. You need to walk in his power. You need to walk in his power. To stay consistent in our walk with Jesus, we have to be connected to him and we need to be filled by him. Because as much as we might want to believe that we're strong, we're not. We're not strong enough. We're not smart enough, we're not good enough, we're not anything enough. It's only being connected and filled by him that allows us to walk this thing out. There's a reason why God didn't die on the cross and go to heaven and say, hey, I'll see you in a little bit, do your best. What he said was, no, 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 I'm gonna leave the Holy Spirit that's gonna fill you and empower you to be able to walk this thing out. He will be your helper. Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, our source of strength, our source of power, has, it comes from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But let me explain it like this. Um, let's say that um, in the parking lot, I, I have parked a 1970 Plymouth Barracuda. If you don't know what that is, it looks like this. It's out there in the parking lot. I walk over, I'm like, dude, I got the Cuda with me. I pull out the keys, and I'm like, listen, let's take it for a spin. And I toss you the keys. Like, who here would be like, come on, Jesus, yeah. right? You're like, what? We going, on, we going on a ride, and you gave me the keys to drive? 
we'd go out there, man, you'd put the key in the ignition and you'd look at me and be like, let's go, right? You turn the key. What happens if you turn the key and you don't even hear a click? Nothing happens. I mean, you, what you want is the, you know, but what you get is a, you'd probably do it once or twice and then you'd look at me and then I'd look at you and be like, dude, I mean, I only got so much money. I got the outside. I just couldn't afford, you know, I opened the hood and there's just a hole there. Like I couldn't afford the engine, right? But isn't she beautiful? I mean, look, look at this thing. Isn't she gorgeous? You would look at me holding keys going, what are you giving me these for? Like, what are we doing, right? And dude, the car still works. I mean, we could push it. We could tie a horse to it. You'd be like, yeah, but at some point, we ain't, we, it's just going to stop. It's just not going to go any further. That's the same thing when it comes to our walks as disciples. When we're not connected to Jesus, I can push you. Some people can push you and some people can pull you. But at some point, you're just going to be stuck right where you're at because you ain't going to get anywhere. You ain't going to be able to walk into the plans and purposes and do the things that God has called you to do. Why? Because you're not connected to the source. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? I'm telling you that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit and connected to God consistently, plugged in. I'm telling you that there are a lot of people trying to focus on looking like disciples on Sunday when the truth is they got no engine. Like they got no engine. Why? And they got no engine because they're not connected to God the rest of the week. They're just showing up clean. Look at me. Look at me on the outside. I'm beautiful. But where's the substance? What's God doing in your life? What's God doing through your life? To accomplish the plan God has for you, you need to be more than just the shell on the outside. You need the engine. You need to be consistently connected to God. I have this lamp here. It's another way I was going to show you guys the same example. Like, like, let me ask you this question. Is this a lamp? It's a lamp regardless if it's plugged in or unplugged. It is still a lamp. It's still a lamp, Right? But, but what happens when all of a sudden I do this and I take it and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put these two pieces together. Oh, like all of a sudden it, it becomes, it, it's able to do more than it was. If we were in a dark room, all of a sudden that lamp becomes the light. All of a sudden it has a use, right? There's something about it. Plugging in the lamp changes it. Can I tell you that you being consistently plugged into God changes you? Like the change you're hungry for, the thing you want to happen in you, when you hear people say, God will change you from the inside, that happens when you're plugged into him. He's not a God that forces himself. Remember I told you I wish he would just tie me and drag me around? He also doesn't just like dive into your soul and into your life and say, you know what, make some room for me. I wish he did, but he doesn't do that. You have to invite him in. You have to take things out and go, no, no, I'm going to take this out. I'm going to take this. Out. God, could you help me move this? This is a big piece of furniture inside me. I need to move this out of my house so that there's space for you. The, 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 the sad part is, is that what, what a lot of our lives look like, it looks like this. It looks, looks like this. It looks like, man, I'm a disciple for Jesus. You know, I need to read my Bible. You start reading the word, but then you stop reading the word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray, I'm going to pray. And there's a season you start praying, but then you stop praying. I'm going to go to that life group and you go and you visit a life group and, you're, and it's like, it's, you're, you're getting close and then, and then you just stop going. No, no, I'm going to serve because there's a place for me. Pastor Mike says there's a place for me on the dream team. Everybody's supposed to play a part in the family of God. So, oh no, I'm going to serve, I'm going to serve. I'm going to go to the interest meeting. But then you don't come and you stop serving. You know what this looks like? This looks like a hazard light. Doesn't it? Like, there's danger. Like, there's a problem. Like, there's a, there's a problem. Like, this, is, this is what some of us look like. Listen, we have to be plugged in consistently, constantly plugged into the Lord so that we can do and live out the thing he's called us and created us to do. To be the person that we're created to be. That's, you, know what, you know what that looks like on an everyday life? It's called opening up your Bible every day. Well, how long? Did I give you a time? Because when I read the word, I haven't found that verse where it says, read the Bible at least this long every day. But what he does say is spend time with me every day. Pray every day. Well, what does that look like? Does it look formal? Does it look informal? It looks like all in between. As a matter of fact, the Bible says to pray without ceasing. Am I supposed to look like a crazy person praying all the time? No. 
but can I tell you that I talk to God throughout the whole day? There are times I go to him and he's Father God and I'm like, Father God, holy, amazing God, hallowed be your name. You are immense and greater than anything I could ever come at. God, you are so big and so huge. And I'm all formal and all big and kind of like this. And then there's later times in the day where I'm like, God, I need you to show up, bro. Where are you at? Because right now I'm about to lose my mom. And then there's other times where I'm like, God, ooh, man, praise God, somebody brought me a coat. Thank you and thank you. That's what praying without ceasing looks like. It's a constant conversation, a connecting with the Lord where I share my whole life with him. Good, bad, formal, informal. All of it is a part of it. He's my father. He's my best friend. He's the Lord creator. He's all of those things. And I talk to him like he's all of those things. And that's what we're supposed to do. Plug into him every day. Read his word. Spend time with him. Pray, get connected in the life group. All of a sudden, surround yourself with people that are pushing you towards them. Next thing you know, what you find is you find yourself plugged in. You wanna get off that coaster, you gotta live in his presence, you gotta follow his plan, you gotta walk in his power, and if Angel, you'll help me out. Here's the last one. You gotta live for his praise. Live for his praise, all right? When you try to please everybody, who do you end up pleasing? Nobody. You try to make everybody happy, trust me, you'll make nobody happy. And too many times what we do as disciples is we get caught up in trying so hard to impress the people around us that we stop asking this question, God, am I still pleasing you? We want to be liked and accepted so much that we stop asking the Lord, God, am I accepting to you? Am I pleasing you? That's what happens when we live for the praise and admiration of people rather than Jesus. Can I tell you this? When we do that, we will always hurt our walk with Jesus. Always. It always leads to hurting our our walk with the Lord when we try to please the people around us. And that's everybody. That doesn't, it's not the world. I'm not talking about just the world or your boss that you don't like. I'm talking about everybody, your pastor, your your other Christian friends around you. Like when you are trying to please people rather than please the Lord, it will always hurt your walk with the Lord. I say that because I've seen it. I've seen people that are are killing themselves trying to serve a church seven days a week. And like, what are you doing? Did God tell you to do this? Because you look awful. You used to be friendly, but you have no joy. Well, somebody's got to do it. Yes. Did God tell you to do it? If not, then you're not supposed to be the one doing it. Well, they ain't doing it. It's okay. God will work on their heart, and at some point, he'll find somebody to do it. But it ain't you unless he tells you. Now, I'm not giving everybody a green light to, like, forget it. I'm done serving because it's inconvenient. I'm just telling you to do what God's told you to do. Both do what he's told you to do if you ain't doing it, but stop doing some of the stuff you're trying to do to impress somebody because no one's being impressed. And you're only hurting yourself and hurting your walk with the Lord. I like, I like this, this saying that's so the, the, one of the biggest lies in the world. I don't care what anybody thinks. That is a lie. Everybody cares what people think. That's why we, that's why we, that's why we put on clothes. <laughs> Let's take it that far. Like we all want to be accepted. We all want to be liked at, to some level. But the problem doesn't come when we want to be liked or accepted. It's okay to want to be liked. It's okay to want to be accepted. You were made for community, which means those are natural things you want. The problem comes in when all of a sudden we allow other people to determine our value. The problem comes in when we start saying, you know what? I I need to know if, if you like me more than you're asking God, God, do you like who I am? Do you like what I'm doing? See, our goal in life has to be to please God. Not, not man, not, not another person. Can I tell you how we do that? By choosing to live for him. By waking up every day and saying, God, today I'm gonna, I'm gonna live for you. I'm gonna get off this coaster where I go up and down and back and forth and in the world and in, in the Lord. And, and no, 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 I'm, I'm gonna live for you. I'm gonna tell you how you make that consistent. Just choose to do it every day. Like today, worry about today. Tomorrow, wake up and go, God, today, I'm gonna give you today. All day today, I'm, today's your day. Then, then the next day, just get up and be like, God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you today. Just, just today. 
Like, I'm not telling you you got to be perfect forever. I'm not even telling you perfect. you got to be perfect today. I'm just telling you today, choose to say, God, I die to myself and I give you my life. I'm going to live for you today. Because when we do that, that's when we start living for God. And, 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 and it begs the question, okay, so, so living for God is choosing to live for that? Yeah, he's choosing to live in his presence. It's choosing to follow his plan, right? It's, it's choosing to, to walk in his power, right? It's choosing to walk and, and live for, for his praise. Those are the four principles that I told you about. And we can do it. Amen? Amen. Bow your heads. Here's my question. Aren't some of you guys tired of, of the Christian coaster? Aren't you tired of being tossed around up and down, hot and cold when it comes to your walk with Jesus? Aren't you ready for, for something real, something deeper, something consistent living and growing? I think it's time for some of us to get off that coaster. And I believe that you can have a consistent and stable relationship with Jesus. But I also know that it starts with those four principles. Choosing to live in his presence, choosing to, to follow his plan, to walk in his power, choosing to live for his praise. Those are four areas that I know aren't always easy to do. So here's my question, just to be honest, let's just be honest right now. I'm gonna pray a prayer and I wanna know who wants to pray this prayer with me. Who here would say, when it comes to those four things, man, there's one or more of those areas. I don't care if it's two or three or one or whatever, but there's, when it comes to those four things, man, there's, <laughs> there's one, that's one area I need, I need some help in. I need to lean in more. I need it, whether it's, I need to work in, in living in his presence more, or I need to, I need to, I need to work on uh, following his plan. I mean, I need, a, I need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to plug into him every day. I'm not, I haven't been doing that. No, no, God, I want to live for your praise. I'm tired of living for other people. If that's you and you would say, yeah, I need, I need, I need, I, God, I'm sorry. I, I want to lean in on one of these areas. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? Jesus, you see the hands raised all over this room and we're raising our hands because we recognize, God, that we want to live completely and totally for you. Lord, some of us, some of us wanna live in your presence, Lord, wherever we go, Lord, no longer hiding and no longer keeping areas of our lives, but Lord, going into every day, recognizing that you are with us, that when we're weak, you're strong, that when we need you, you're right there, Lord. Lord, some of us need to hear from you and we wanna follow your plan, Lord. We want to stop jumping ahead or trying to do things our own way, Lord. Sometimes we think we're smarter than we are, and we are sorry for that. We want to follow your voice, Lord. Would you be loud? Would you help us to connect with you, Lord, to walk in your power? Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit again. We want to hear your Holy Spirit. We want to, would you awaken the gifts of the Holy Spirit in us, Lord? That we would walk in your power and in your truth, Lord. And would you help us to live for your praise and your praise alone? Yes, Lord, we want to be accepted. Yes, we want to be liked, Lord, but more than that, we want to be yours. So, Lord, we're sorry for the things we've done that have caused us to, to not do well in these areas, Lord, but we, we choose to walk away from those things and lean into you. We love you, and we are yours. Now, keep your eyes closed for one more minute. Let me talk to the room again. Let me ask this question. Is there anybody here that would say, you know what, I need to make things right with Jesus? Like you recognize that it's, it's more than just these, these four principles that you need. You need Jesus. If you're here and you know like you haven't been living for Jesus, you haven't been living with Jesus, right? But you want to. You're ready to ask him to forgive you, to come into your life, to be Lord of your life, whether it's for the first time and you've never done it, or maybe you were living for Jesus at one point in your life, but you stopped. You stopped living for him, but you want to come back. I'm gonna pray a prayer of repentance, of, of asking Jesus to be Lord of our life. If that's you and you want that, I want you to open your eyes and just look up at me. Just open your eyes and look up at me on the stage. Listen, I can't see real well, so I wanna know who I'm praying with. So if your eyes are open and you're looking at me, just kind of do one of these. And I, when I see you, I'll tell you, you can just put your hand down, but I wanna know who I'm praying with. I see you, bro, you can put your hand down. I see you, you can put your hand down too. I, I see both you guys upstairs, yeah. I see you upstairs, I see you upstairs, I see you right here, I see you right there. I see both of you guys right there. I see you and you, come on, Jesus. I'm gonna keep looking. I see both of you guys upstairs there. I see you right there, yep. I see you in the back and so does Jesus. Isn't he good? So good. 
I'm gonna look for a couple seconds more. I just don't wanna miss you if you're here. Don't let the enemy keep lying to you. The Bible says that today is the day of salvation. If you believe in your heart and you confess in your mouth, with your mouth, that he is Lord, which means today is the day of a fresh start for you. Is there anybody else before I pray? It's hard to see. All right. Awesome. Let's do this. Can everybody stand with me? If you raise your hand, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for seeing me and thank you for letting me see you. I choose to see you, Lord. I choose to accept you. Lord, I confess with my mouth that you are Lord of all, that you died on a cross for my sins. And that because you did, I can receive forgiveness. So I receive that forgiveness now. Lord, I confess with my mouth that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. I give you my heart. I give you my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your joy. Fill me with your peace. Lord, be the loudest voice in my life. I want to live for you. Help me to live in your presence. Lord, whisper the plan for me, even if it's just a small piece of the puzzle. Lord, I want to go in whatever direction you send me, Jesus. Fill me with your power, Lord, that I can walk in confidence that you're with me. Lord, heal the wounds of my life. Lord, I believe that I'm made new in you today, which means I get a fresh start. Thank you for that. Lord, I want to spend the rest of my life living to give you praise. I am yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said. Come on, everybody said. Let's give God praise in this place. He is good. He is so, so good. Listen, there's a... This is not supposed to be today that I'm supposed to do this commercial, but I'm going to do this commercial. In about, I think it's a month, There's a thing called the School of the Spirit. There's like a a one night, Thursday night uh, thing that our, our, we call our district or our section um, is doing. It's basically the Assemblies of God um, doing this class on, or this service on what 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 does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to to be empowered by God? What what does that all that mean? Kind of unpacking all that in one night. And what we're doing is they asked if they they could, we could host it. Actually, I asked the leader, I was like, "Can, can we host it? And he said, yes. So it's going to be happening here. And there'll be a bunch of other churches that'll join and and, and come. But um, hear your pastor say, I want as many of our church people to be here. Because I do believe that. I do believe that we are these lamps that are more powerful than lamps that are walking around. And if we would just understand who we are and who he is and how he's empowered us, I think we would see just the incredible happen in our lives and in our families and through us all over, all over our community, all over wherever we go. So I'll give you more announcements about that as it comes, but just I want to pre pre give you this, like, this is your pastor telling you, I want you to be here. Okay. All right, let me pray for you guys. Raise your hands. You know what? Let's close family style. Let's close family style. Go ahead and grab somebody. If you don't know what that means, somebody might lean over and and put their arm around you. If you don't want somebody to touch you, just look at them with that look that says, don't touch me. And and they won't touch you. So, Um, but if not, let's pray for each other. All right, you sound good? All right. Jesus, we pray for the person on our left and the person on our right. We thank you for them, Lord. We pray blessings over their lives, Lord. Give them favor, favor in their jobs, favor in their schools, favor wherever they go, Lord God. We pray protection over them, Lord. We pray health over them and their families, Lord. Let them walk into this week feeling empowered by you, led by you. Give them a chance this week to tell somebody about who you are and what you're doing in their lives. You are good, Lord, and we live for you, Lord. So be the loudest voice. We wanna chase you, Lord. We want to follow you. We want to, we want to do and, and see you do the incredible around us, Lord. All for your glory, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this place called Life Point. We thank you for our Life Point family. We ask you to just continue to fill this place with lost and broken people that need you, that need to hear about a God that loves them and has a plan and purpose for them. You are good, and we are yours. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Everybody said? Amen. I love you guys. Stay cool out there. <laughs>